where in our society do the crazy ideas really get tried? It's the entrepreneurs, it's small teams of guys and girls who are so passionate about making something happen, they're willing to risk everything for something they believe in. It's always the craziest ideas. Most of the world just might not be uh, looking at it from the same angle. I think it's important to risk uh, for something that you believe in. You rewrite the rules. I took uh, Stephen Hawking up and uh, gave him the time of his life when he was floating in zero G. Ultimately, our goal is to go back to from whence we came, star Oops. stuff. Oops. Dr. Peter Diamandis is an engineer and the founder of XPRIZE, a foundation that awards multi-million dollar prizes to technological developments that benefit mankind. He's a co-founder of 12 companies, including Space Adventures Limited, which has sent eight civilians to the International Space Station. And he's the co-author of the New York Times bestseller, Abundance, The Future is Better Than You Think. I always say this show is my chance to learn, and today I'm honored to be learning from one of the greatest minds of our planet. Thank you for coming to talk to me today. My pleasure, thank you. Let me get right into it by asking you, what is incentivized innovation? I believe that there is no problem on this planet we can't solve, mm -hmm. fundamentally. What we do is we put up a very clear goal, like a target, and we ask people around the world to try and solve that problem. What we're learning is that real breakthrough solutions come from the most unexpected places because sometimes the expert is the guy or the gal who can tell you exactly how it can't be done. Mm. And a true breakthrough is someone who looks at a problem with a new point of view and says, why can't you do it this way? And that's really the breakthrough. So I got my start in, in incentivized competitions reading about Charles Lindbergh. And the story is that at the turn of the last century, in 1919, a Frenchman, Raymond Orteig, uh, who is born in Paris, grows up in New York, wants to connect his old home and his new home with aviation, offers up a $25,000 prize for the first person to fly between New York and Paris. Mm. And everybody laughed at him, said it can't be done, it's too crazy an idea, that's way longer than anyone ever, ever flown. And, but this $25,000 prize inspires nine different teams to spend $400,000. And Lindbergh, the most unlikely guy to do it, he was called the flying fool, because no one would sell him an airplane or an engine, makes the flight and opens up aviation. Mm. Now the question we ask is, okay, th the goal there was opening up global aviation. What's the new goal? What is a problem we want to solve? Can we set a very clear goal and then inspire teams to go and attack it and solve it? It's always the craziest ideas, you know, and who are we to say that they're crazy? It's just that most of the world just might not be, um, you know, looking at it from the same angle, but, you know, they eventually get it when it serves humanity. It's very true. For Alan, when I say that you know, the day before something is truly a breakthrough, it's a crazy idea, mm -hmm. right? If it wasn't a crazy idea, it wouldn't be a breakthrough. It'd be a you know, a little faster computer is not a breakthrough, but going from using vacuum tubes to silicon is a breakthrough. And so, where do where do crazy ideas get tried? What happens is the large companies, the biggest companies in the world, are afraid to try crazy ideas because if they fail and they get egg on their face, their stock price plummets. Mm. And the government. Also the same thing, if you try something big and it fails publicly, there's a congressional investigation. So where in our society do the crazy ideas really get tried? It's the entrepreneurs, it's the, you know, the sm small teams of guys and girls who are so passionate about making something happen, they're willing, they're willing to risk everything, their lives, their reputation, their fortunes for something they believe in. And that's where true innovation comes from, that kind of inner drive. Would you say that there was a moment in your childhood uh, that sort of prompted you to like fall in love with space? Oh yeah, yeah, sure. Both my parents were immigrants from Greece and I grew up in New York, born in the Bronx. My dad became a doctor and was expected that I'd become a doctor too and ended up pursuing uh, medicine. But all my youth, it was Star Trek, you know, and the Apollo program that was my inspiration. Right, you, you went to med medical school, I did go to right? medical school. I went, I went to medical school to make my mom happy. <laughs> I went all the way through, never practiced. In fact, I had two companies going my fourth year of medical school. I had started a university called International Space University, and I started a, a rocket launch company. I had a famous meeting with my dean of medical school who basically called me in one day because he said, you know, you're not paying very much attention at school these days. Mm -hmm. And you're like, you're on the phone all the time. I had bought one of those large motor brick phones. And he goes, do you want to graduate? And I said, I do, I very much do want to graduate. Uh, but I fessed up and I said, but my love, my passion is space. And I'm doing this other stuff. 
And he said, I'll make you a deal. Um, I'll let you graduate if you promise not to practice medicine. <laughs> wow. And he kept his bargain and I kept mine. And is that what sent you back to MIT? I chose going after space and, and doing my aerospace engineering work at MIT because it was my calling in life. You know, yeah. when people say you have a, a, a God-given mission, Sure. my mission, my calling was opening the space frontier. I said, I'm going to be part of humanity's exploration of the cosmos. It's what drives me. I think we have a moral obligation to explore the world. My friend Elon Musk talks about backing up the biosphere. Mm -hmm. You know, everything we've ever heard uh, created is on this small planet we have. Right. Every life form, every piece of data, every piece of music and dance and culture is here. Totally. And if we get wiped out, you know, by an asteroid strike, by any human disaster, or whatever it might be, I'm an optimist and, and don't, you know, think we can avoid those things. But should we? What a terrible loss. Totally. But just as I'm, we're on the very edge of being able to make, imagine being able to like, duplicate all the data on the internet and take it off the world. Imagine being able to like sequence every species on the planet and take that, that data. We can literally, not I want to say necessarily duplicate, but back up, you know, we back up our computers, we back up all our data, you could back up the earth if one sense, because we're about to become a multi-planetary species. Well, there's a, isn't there a seed farm and- uh, There is a seed farm. Yeah. And, yeah. and So that's like the start. I mean, start. We, we're, we're behind, <laughs> based on your schedule, we're behind. <laughs> it is a start, but we're still here on this one planet. Yeah. And um, there is the sense that, you know, it's the 1490s, you know, uh, you know, Columbus is looking out across the Atlantic and saying there's a new world there. We're at that very beginning where we're looking out at the cosmos and saying, you know, Mars, maybe colonies we create. Sure. And it's all science fiction. It's all impossible. It's all crazy until we pull it off. Thousands of years from now, we're going to be looking back at these next few decades as the moment in time where the human race left Earth and became multi-planetary species. Oh yeah. We're becoming conscious on a completely new level of existence. Yeah. We're, we're far more uh, connected as, as a species than ever before, and that leads, I think, ultimately to uh, an uplifting of all of society. Totally. Yeah.